comme on s'endort Calme et sans penser à rien En fermant les yeux très fort Vivre Il fait beau, je sors Je trouverai le bon chemin Et je me sens mieux dehors Open the solar bay. Good morning, everyone. We are pleased to welcome you for our, our 2023 financial results. Uh, this presentation will be made by Luca De Meo, CEO of Renault Group, and Thierry Pieton, CFO of Renault Group, and will be followed by a Q&A session. Luca, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, so, and thank you for being with us. So, you know, in the life of a company, every moment uh, is, a, is a challenge, and especially in automotive, and uh, especially in our times. You can actually never be sure whether you will stay in the game, but uh, sometimes uh, people that do my job uh, get the most important re reward, I would say, a leader can have. And because you realize that you have the right team, you have the right mindset, uh, and that you have created a dynamic that will keep your performance sustainable. So, and apparently, we are also kind of keeping our competitors awake, even forcing them to wake up very, very early in the morning. So I want to take the opportunity to congratulate them for the excellent results. Uh, so, chapeau, as we say in French. But you will see that we also have to bring a few uh, good news. So, Renault, group financial performance is actually higher than it has ever been in more than a century. It's simple. In 2023, we are breaking records on every major financial KPI. We outperformed the guidance that we had already raised in June. In 2023, we achieved a record operating margin of 7.9%. This is actually two points above our initial guidance at the beginning of the year. And uh, we generated three billion of uh, free cash flow. For Renault, is something historic. 
over the decade before the COVID, we generated less than uh, 1 billion per, per year on average. So this number shows that uh, we have changed something structural in the system. Uh, it's the first time that the machine is designed to deliver financial performance. And the beauty of the thing is that we have managed to put the product back at the core of our strategy while we were very busy restructuring the company. The fact uh, that this is a solid work uh, is even more obvious if you look not only at the snapshot, but all at the old movie. So in only three years, we went from record losses to record results, constantly improving our operational performance. And this powerful dynamic is the result of in-depth work that we have been doing and that we are still doing uh, on our lineup, on our commercial policy, on our cost structure, and of course on our organization. This new breed of you know, type of organization that we have uh, put in place is designed to uh, capture value on all new automotive value chains through dedicated and focused businesses. We call it the next gen automotive company. The idea behind it is very simple. The automotive landscape is being radically transformed. Instead of one sport, we now have to play at least five different uh, disciplines address five different uh, value chains and tap into five different profit pools. So to excel in these five sports, we need five type of athletes, each of them 100% focused. These are power, ampere, alpine, mobilize, and neutral. When I arrived at Renault, what uh, struck me was the complexity of its uh, structure. It was a matrix organization with too many dimensions, brands, regions, countries, functions, and of course also the alliance. You can ask any philosopher, they will tell you that beyond three dimensions you are, you are already, already in the space of metaphysics. So we've stopped with metaphysics. We killed the matrix organization. We have created focus on what matters and uh, we have plugged the company onto the new value pools. We brought transparency and accountability at the level of the businesses where the things are really happening every day. And every day this organization supports our relentless quest for performance improvement and capital allocation optimization. So cost reduction will remain and remains our obsession. I confirm that we are going to reduce cost of EVs by 40% thanks to Ampere. For ICE and hybrid cars, we will achieve 30% uh, cost reduction by 2027. We push our efforts well beyond our traditional scope. We have dramatically increased our control on our value chain. Traditionally, car makers dealt only with tier one suppliers in a very classical way. Supply chain was a black box in a way. We have opened it, and this is what we do when we deal, for example, with Qualcomm or when we co-develop with ST Microelectronics, with Valeo and, uh, and many others. So our horizontal approach is an additional level of performance improvement, allowing us to share investment and risks all along, all along the value chains that we have to cover. We are also pushing the limits to reduce development time. A few years ago, it took us at least four years to de develop a new car. Now we're developing the new EV Twingo in around two years. All these efforts are boosting Renault Group's capital efficiency. So we'll achieve over 30% Roche uh, by 2025. And remember, we started from zero in 2021. Besides um, performance improvement, our new organization supports our second mantra, this is strategic agility and flexibility to address the ongoing automotive transition. We have designed the next gen company to be ready to smartly adapt to the changing pace of markets and technologies. Of course, the end game is clear, but we know that there will be ups and downs to get there. We are all set for the journey thanks to two clear assets allowing us to play the smooth transition. Ampere on the one end, 
This is our EV and software champion, tailored to outpace the EV pure players in the race towards EV ice price parity. And power and horse, on the other hand, generating cash, de-risking the group, racing to reinvent the ICE technology through smart hybridization, synthetic fuels, and ultra-low emission uh, solutions. And of course, out there are also mobilize the future is neutral and Alpine to support the group business model with differentiating products and solution on the new mobility services, circular economy, and profitable high-end uh, car value chains. Boosting strategic agility also uh, has also been our key objective when we have uh, reshuffled our alliance with Nissan and Mitsubishi. At the core of this new alliance, we have put operational projects that have the potential to generate hundreds of millions of euros every year. Each company is free to move forward with its own projects and uh, the others can join, not because they have to, but because it makes business sense. My job now is to leverage this great dynamic in the teams to take advantage of an unprecedented product life cycle, pushing the system to secure long-term performance and to catch new grow, growth opportunities. I will tell you more about that in a few minutes, but before that, Thierry will go more in detail on the financial results. Thank you, Luca, and uh, good morning, and thanks again to all of you for, for joining us. Um, so I'll go straight into the financial performance, uh, starting with the revenue. So our group revenue was up 13.1% in 2023 at 52.4 billion euros. At constant exchange rates, it was up 17.9%. Mobility services amounted to 45 million euros, up 10 million compared to last year. The revenue from our captive finance company, Mobilized Financial Services, grew 31.8% to 4.2 billion euros, mostly driven by the rise in interest rates and by a strong increase in average finance amount. Let's drill down now in the uh, automotive revenue. Automotive revenue stood at 48.2 billion for the year, up 11.7%. At constant exchange rate, it was up 16.5%. Forex was a negative by 4.8 points and mostly linked to the Argentinian peso devaluation and to a lesser, lesser extent, the Turkish lira. The volume and geographic mix buckets together were a positive at 5.7 points. Volume-wise, the group registered 2.2 million units in the year, a 9% increase compared to 2020, 2022. Sorry. All brands contributed to this growth growth. In 2023, Renault brand was the best-selling French brand in the world, with a 9.4% growth. In Europe, the brand moved from fifth to second place in the passenger car and LCV market. In light commercial vehicles in particular, with a 25.7% growth, Renault took the second place and was first in commercial vans. Dacia sales were up nearly 15% worldwide. The new brand identity is proving very successful month after month. In Europe, its core market, the brand confirmed its second place on the retail channel. The extreme trim level launched on all vehicles at the beginning of 2023 now represents a third of orders across the entire range, attracts new customers, and crucially, generates incremental contribution margin. Alpine continued its double-digit growth in the high-end segment for the third consecutive year, with more than 4,000 units sold. It delivered a 22% growth versus 2022. From a geographic perspective, sales in Europe were up 18.6%, a strong outperformance versus a market up 13.9%. This market share gain was mostly driven by our product, our product offensive. More on this later. Renault Group, moved up to the third place among car manufacturers in Europe. And this led to a higher mix of European sales and explains the positive 1.7 points of geographic mix effect. For the overall group, the 9% growth in retail sales translated into a 4% volume effect 
as the increase in registrations was, was partially offset by a lower restocking in the independent dealers network in 23 compared to 22, in particular in the fourth quarter of the year. Global inventories stood at 484,000 units at the end of December, compared to 480,000 units in December of 2022. This is better than the objective that we had communicated to you of being below a total distribution stock of 500,000 units by the end of the year, and allows us to enter 2024 with a very healthy inventory position. This should also be put in perspective with the still high order book, which stands at two and a half months of forward sales. It reflects the success of our launches and remains above our target level of two months plus. In 2023, we benefited from a strong price and product mix effect. All in all, they represented 8.4 points. The price effect was a strong positive at 7.4 points for the full year. As anticipated, even if it continues to be strong, it started to ease, uh, mostly due to tougher comps and less pressure to offset raw materials. The price effect was mainly driven by performance in the following areas. First, a continued discipline in channel mix. Almost two thirds of our sales are made in the retail channel and specifically 50% for the Renault brand in Europe. Secondly, a strong control over var variable marketing expenses, which includes incentives to dealers. Thirdly, the continued favorability of our trim mix, thanks to the attractiveness of the range. And finally, pricing power that allows us to more than cover adverse exchange rate impacts where necessary. Switching to the product mix effect, it stood at positive one point, mainly thanks to the success of Austral, Espace, and LCVs. A lower figure in the second half of the year mainly results from a strong sales performance from Clio, which has a revenue per unit that's below the group's average. Nonetheless, as you will see, the model, the model mix is positive for our margin. In the second half of the year, it drove a 50 basis points positive effect on the group's operating margin. Let me give you an update on the products that supported this performance. Starting with Megan. Megan E-Tech is still the number one EV of its segment in France. In 2023, it ranks number three of its segment in Europe even with volumes that are below the levels we anticipated at the, the time of the launch, this car remains a conquest product in Europe with more than 50% of our clients, which are new to the Renault brand. In 2023, we sold 47,000 units, of which 70% are higher trim versions and over 80% are equipped with the most powerful powertrain. By the way, the residual value of Megane continued to increase in 2023. In the meantime, we worked hard on costs in line with the roadmap detailed last November during the Ampere CMD. Because we started to benefit from the first cost reductions on the vehicle, we also started to reflect it in the price of Megane to ensure that it remains competitive. In France, Austral became the leader of the retail CSUV segment and Renault Brands the leader in the C segment in 2023. Austral sales amounted to more than 86,000 units in the year, 100% were electrified, and 62% were E-Tech full hybrid, 60% were, were configured in the highest trim levels. Austral is a car with outstanding financials and delivers historical levels of contribution margin. The record, though, now belongs to the car on the next slide, which is none other than Espace. Espace is an important conquest product on the D segment. It enjoys an 80% commonality rate with Austral. This enables it to deliver record contribution margin, even though we reduced its selling price compared to the previous generation. Espas sales are off to a good start. 80% of the sales are in the high trim level. In H2 of 2023, we also introduced the new Clio with the E-Tech hybrid version, further in reinforcing the group's offensive on electrification. Clio was the best selling vehicle in France in 2023 and is now number three in Europe. Thanks to significant cost improvements, it's posting a higher contribution margin than the previous generation, while its price is actually lower. As you will see later with Luca, this Renault lineup will be strengthened by important launches in 2024. 
Dacia's four pillar models all grew in 2023 with two vehicles on the podium of retail sales in Europe. Sandero was the second car sold in Europe last year and remains the top seller on the European retail market since 2017. Dacia Spring recorded close to 62,000 sales in Europe in 2023. This car is the most affordable EV in Europe and was the third best-selling electric vehicle to retail customers. Last but not least, despite approaching the end of its life, the current Duster was number two of retail SUVs in Europe. New Duster will be launched in the upcoming months and will ensure the continued success story of Dacia, our double-digit brand. Switching to Alpine, Alpine A110 maintained a strong momentum driven by the success of the limited editions. Alpine starts 2024 with a seven months order book, thanks, for example, to the successful start of the A110R Turini, launched in December. In a nutshell, the success of our lineup fed the revenue growth. It was also a key driver for our operating performance, and I'll come back to this in a moment. To finish the analysis of the revenue change, our sales to partners contributed positively for 2.1 points. They benefited from the production of Colt and ASX for Mitsubishi and illustrates the common projects that we're restarting with the Alliance. We also benefited from a dynamic LCV market, driving our sales to Nissan, Renault trucks, and Mercedes. Now let's move to profitability. In 2023, we increased our profit by more than 60%, delivering 4.1 billion euros, which is 7.9% of revenue, up 2.4 points versus 2022. This is at the top of our guidance, which as Luca mentioned, we had already increased last June. This performance is driven by the progress of the operating profit of our op automotive segment, which stood at 3.1 billion euros, or 6.3%, of auto revenue. We basically more than doubled our automotive segment of profit versus 2022. Our financing activity, Mobilized Financial Services, delivered a 1.1 billion euro contribution. This slide showcases our fast and strong transformation throughout the last three years. 7.9% operating margin is the new record, as mentioned for the group. In H2, we reached 8.1%. We're closing the gap with some of our competitors, but this is not the end. We're 100% focused on continuing to improve our operational performance year after year. In 2023, our operating margin increased by 1.5 billion euros. The biggest contribution came from price, mix, and enrichment for almost 3 billion. Price, mix, and enrichment taken individually were all strong profit contributors in H1 and in H2. This reflects our commercial policy, the vitality of our lineup. This affects obviously way more than compensated the strong cost headwinds. Despite good operational cost performance, our cost of goods sold increased year on year about 1.6 billion euros. This was primarily driven by raw materials and other input costs namely logistics, energy, and labor costs. Raw material weighed for 216 million. After almost 350 million negative in H1, the trend reversed in H2. Logistics and energy costs continued to weigh in H2, despite a meaningful sequential improvement. After 1.2 billion of cost effect in H1, the pressure is now easing very significantly. Looking at SGNA, they increased by 389 million euros, mainly driven by the marketing costs due to the ongoing product offensive and by labor cost. Most of the positive 376 million euros in the other item are explained by price increases in Renault Group subscription plans in Argentina. In this country, Renault, as other OEMs, offers a subscription plan in which individuals can collectively contribute towards the purchase of a vehicle. As you remember, uh, a few words on horse. As you remember, in November 2022, we announced our intention to merge our ICE and hybrid powertrain and gearbox business with Geely's equivalent activities and form a world-leading supplier. 
Since the announcement and in accordance with IFRS 5, we reclassified horses' assets and assets held for sale and ceased their amortization. In 2023, this resulted in non-cash positive effect on our operating margin, which amounted to 482 million euros, which is 398 million more than in 2022. As stated, it's non-cash, so we had no impact on free cash flow in 23. Restated from this impact, the group operating margin would have been 6.6% in H1 and 7.3% in H2, up 0.7 points sequentially. Clearly, performance continues to improve, whether you include the impact of horse or not. The JV agreement was signed in July, and the closing of the deal is currently pending approval from antitrust and foreign direct investment authorities. Until closing, the freeze, the freeze of amortization will continue to have a non-cash positive impact every month. When the deal closes, we will deconsolidate horse and consolidate our share of the combined equity, uh, entity on an equity basis. At this point, the amortization of horse assets will resume and be included in the price that we pay for the powertrains. Horse will take a margin as a supplier and synergies will more than compensate this margin from the second year. All in all, for 2024, we took an assumption of a slight negative impact from horse on operating margin. This number has to be compared with a positive impact of 482 million just mentioned. These effects are taken into account in the 2024 operating margin guidance that we'll cover later on. Now let's comment on the performance of mobilized financial services. Mobilized financial services generated 21 billion euros of new financings, up 17.1% thanks to the, the growth in registrations, compounded with a 9.9% increase of the average financed amount. Average performing assets amounted to 51.2 billion, a 6.4 billion uh, 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 increase versus 2022, driven by both new retail and wholesale financing, the latter due to the return of more normal dealer inventory level, levels post electronic components shortages. Net banking income as a percentage of average performing assets was negatively impacted by the reversal of positive swaps valuation impact observed in 2022 and by the higher mix of dealer inventory financing with lower margins. Cost of risk at 0.29% remained at a very low level, both for wholesale and retail. Overall, mobilized financial services posted an operating profit of 1.1 billion euros, excluding the non-recurring impact of swaps this represents an 8% improvement versus 2022. Moving to the key items from our group PL below the operating margin uh, line, the other operating income and expenses were impacted mainly by four elements. First, the 880 million euros capital loss related to the disposal of Nissan shares and non cash items, as you already know. Secondly, assets impairment. Uh, linked to vehicle developments and specific production assets, third, restructuring costs, and finally, on the positive sides, the impact of asset disposals, which amounted to 323 million euros. The slight deterioration of our net financial income and expenses is explained by the impact of hyperinflation in Argentina, partially compensated by the positive impact of the rise in interest rates on our net cash position. Profit from associated companies rose primarily due to Nissan's contribution, which stood at 797 million euros, compared to 526 million posted in 2022. As a reminder, we adjust Nissan's JGAP results to convert to IFRS. Key adjustments concern the valuation of Nissan's stake in Mitsubishi Motors for 228 million euros and deferred tax retreatments. Current and deferred tax represented a charge of 523 million, stable compared to 22. The effect in the pre-tax income, the increase, sorry, in the pre-tax income was driven by the operating performance improvement, but it was offset by the evolution of deferred taxes. The effective tax rate for 2023 was close to what is going to be normative levels. All in all, net income strongly improved 
by more than 3 billion, reaching 2.3 billion euros. Net income group share reached 2.2 billion euros. From the start of Renolution, return on total capital, on capital employed has been a key indicator for us. You can see on this slide that, as Luca mentioned, we made remarkable progress in the last three years, confirming what Luca said about the transformation. From zero in 21, we're now close to 30%, which was our commitment for 2025. Now let's cover how this translates into our cash performance. Renault Group generated 5.5 billion euros of cash in 2023. This is a record for the group and reflects all the work that we've carried out to build a much stronger fundamentals to underpin our performance. This figure included a 600 million dividend inflow from MFS compared to 800 million in 2022. Group CapEx and R&D, excluding the, the, the impact of asset disposals, amounted to 7.3% of revenue versus 7.4% last year. Disposals represented a 282 million cash inflow. The change in working capital requirement was positive, 637 million euros, and is mainly related to the decrease in our inventory levels. Finally, restructuring cash out amounted to 496 million euros. As a result, we generated 3 billion of free cash flow, which is one more new record. Excluding MFS's dividend, it stood at 2.4 billion euros against 1.3 billion in 22, up 1.1 billion. Don't forget that this free cash flow was generated while funding Ampère's development. It shows that we now have ample capacity to continue to do so. This record free cash flow, alongside with around 200 million euros inflow from the sale of the 24% equity stake in Alpine Racing LTD and the positive impact from Nissan shares disposal, uh, strongly contributed to a significant improvement in our automotive financial position. All in all, our net financial position rose by 3.2 billion to reach 3.7 billion. The liquidity of the automotive division stood at a very comfortable level of 17.8 billion at the end of December. As you know, most of the agencies covering the, the, the stock have upgraded their outlook of the rating of Renault Group for 2023. Rewarding our stakeholders is very important for us. We will therefore submit to the approval of our shareholders at the next General Assembly a dividend of 1.85 euro per share payable in cash. It means a 17.5 payout ratio, improving significantly our dividend yield. Then, as we make progress towards our first priority, which is to return to investment grade, the dividend will gradually grow in a disciplined fashion with a goal to reach 35% of group consolidated net income parent share. This concludes the financial section. Luca, back to you for the 24 hour. Merci Thierry. So let's uh, now look rapidly at uh, what com comes next. Uh, so good news, 2024, it's all about products. Um, we'll be launching basically one car every month in average. This has uh, never seen before uh, at Renault. Some, some of those products will be very unique. Uh, boosting our competitiveness. Uh, the Renault 5, of course, this is a return of a legend. This is our ace to democratize next-gen uh, EV and software. Uh, probably the best uh, small EV in the world right now. We will unveil it uh, in Geneva in, uh, in a matter of 10 days. So then we have the Scenic. This is one of the first European EVs designed to touch the heart of the European market, families, user choosers in, uh, in corporate fleets, uh, a product that is very, very competitive versus uh, comparable IC models in cost of ownership and performance uh, in usage. Uh, this is a product that is also showing the future, material, materializing our vision of what we mean when we talk about sustainability, and the product that's well positioned in terms of price versus competition, actually very well. Very well. 
Then we'll have the new master. We call it the Aerovan because of its uh, cutting edge technology and also aerodynamics. It will have the best consumption performance, both in uh, electric and ice version. We are convinced it will reinforce our leadership in uh, LCV in the European market as a, as a brand. And now we'll have the Renault 4. Uh, will be another instant classic. I'm sure you will see uh, more about the final version at the end of, of this year. And alongside our EV push uh, for Renault, we continue to develop our range of uh, e-tech hybrid cars, supporting our renewed global ambition, for example, with Symbios. Uh, this is the ideal small family SUV that uh, we have just revealed last week. I think we have one of the, our best kept secrets and potentially one of the good surprises in the Renault lineup. It's nice, it's practical, and it's very competitive uh, in price. We'll also have Rafale. Uh, so, since long time, Renault didn't have a, such a strong proposition at this uh, level of the market. Uh, it's going to turn heads, and, but also turn some uh, given ideas about our potential to grab some share at that level of the of the of the of the market. And for us, it will represent a very very good additional uh, business. We just opened orders also last week. In 2024, we will also have major launches in Latin America, Turkey, Morocco, and Korea, among other countries. This is the start of the attack plan we have organized for international market, which will develop in the next 36 months. And of course, I don't want to forget our corporate darling. This is Dacia. Uh, we'll renovate the spring, uh, which is one of the most successful EVs in Europe, as Thierry said, just after three years. It will be more performant nicer, and even cheaper. But the big event of the year for this brand is the launch of the third generation of Dasta, so far the most popular SUV in Europe. So looking at the reaction of automotive press, uh, dealers, and customers, I think this car will be a blockbuster. And last but not least, 2024 will be the year where we start the new Alpine journey with the A290. So we'll be busy. But we like that, uh, especially when it comes, it's about introducing our creations and our technologies. So in 2024, the revolution will really materialize into our cars. I want to also to reassure you that while our production and marketing and salespeople will be very busy launching, we're not going to let the product fireworks distract us from our fundamentals. We'll keep extremely focused on cost discipline, especially in those uh, three areas. First, we'll push the envelope on the EV side. In November, we presented our roadmap to achieve 40% cost reduction and reach EV ICE price parity before the competition. In fact, we have already started the journey. You saw it concluded with the price position of the Scenic and the Renault 5. Second, transforming our industrial base uh, puts us on track to reduce production costs by 30% for ICE and hybrid cars and by 50% for EVs by 2027. For example, deploying predictive maintenance AI tools resulted this year in a 270 million euro saving on, uh, on, on energy and, and maintenance. So the, the thing is for real. Uh, for sure. And finally, we have made a huge step on how to master, as I said before, energy efficiency. In two years only, we have reduced the energy consumption per vehicle in our plants by 20%, again through AI monitoring. And we'll go further with a 30% reduction target by 2025 compared to 2021, and even a 40% reduction in the French plants. All this will result in operational improvement and uh, strong cash, cash flow generation in 2024. We aim to achieve over 7.5% of operating margin and will generate over 2.5 billion of uh, free cash flow. So this year is going to be, again, a year of focus, discipline, execution, but uh, don't count on us to switch to cruising mode. 
we know what that uh, what comes in the next uh, automotive uh, you know uh, sector will be no walk in the park only those able to anticipate the next technonic uh, shifts uh, so adapting getting prepared to turn the next disruption to op opportunities to reinvent our industry will have a future we are totally comfortable with that uh, scenario it's a chance for a challenger like uh, Renault Group. So as you can imagine, this is precisely what we are cooking and preparing back into the kitchen. So thank you for your attention. Uh, I now will open to your question. So stay with us if you can for the Q&A. Thank you, Luca. So we will now enter the Q&A session. Um, and we will start with a question uh, from Daniel Roska Bernstein. Daniel, please, could you open your mic? Good morning, everybody. Um, Luca, I'd like to ask you about your medium-term view on pricing for BV and ICE cars. You already made some comments, but how do you see the price points evolving in the long term, and will there be any meaningful difference between them? Right? Do you think consumers will perceive EVs as better cars and have a higher willingness to pay, or will it be the other way around, that actually BV cars might need to be cheaper than ICE cars in the long run? Uh, I think for you know for the for the for this generation, next generation, until 2030, there will always be a slight difference in in um, in pricing, especially for cars with bigger batteries. Of course, when you go into small cars, we can we can you can really reduce the size of the battery because the usage of uh, of the thing is different. Maybe you will find you know more competitive uh, you know BEV offer to ICE. That, that's uh, the kind of, of course, everybody is trying to reduce uh, the cost of uh, EVs to look for price parity of the thing. But, you know, we always discuss about price list, but in fact, what we should look at is the, you know, total cost of ownership of, uh, of the thing. Um, so you, you already see on the scenic that uh, when you calculate the total cost of ownership, including the electricity that you want to use to, you know, run, I don't know, 30,000 kilometers a year. Um, I think, uh, or oh, in three years, sorry, uh, I think that this is uh, already comparable to the hybrid. So we got there. We didn't go to the least price parity. But I'm I, sometimes asking myself whether this is the real, uh, you know, uh, important uh, criteria that uh, will motivate a customer to consider a car or not. So this is... Uh, the way I see it, so you will see probably reduction of price of EVs, uh, and but this generation, um, apart from some segments, this is not necessarily going to happen. But I'm not sure it's the real important thing. Another element, and I finish here because uh, I leave it. Uh, you know, I have to leave time for the other question. Is that we have to be very careful on how do we manage in general the residual value of, of EVs. And uh, I think that uh, Renault, uh, the way we are doing it, is a, a very balanced and long-term, uh, let's say, uh, minded and driven approach. And this is the most dangerous thing, is that for the sake of pushing cars that the market doesn't want, then we destroy the residual value. This is not a good idea. So we try to be the good, uh, you, know, uh, you know, good example on how you can, uh, you know, you can actually manage that. Maybe I'll, I'll take that as a cue and bring in Thierry to ask whether there's a risk on financial services here concerning the lower than expected residual values on BVs in the market. I mean, could you outline what the share of BVs in uh, uh, Mobilize's books is at this point in time? And, you know, is there still room for RVs to fall further um, before that starts impacting your financials on the um, FS business? Yeah, so, so hi, Daniel. So, um, look, it's a relatively small share in the books of mobilized financial services because uh, you, you have uh, basically, you know, three, three years of, uh, of financing in the books at any given moment. And uh, over the last three years, I would say EV is roughly around 10% of, of our exposure in, in, in Europe. So it's relatively limited. Um, mobilize uh, first, uh, you know, doesn't carry the risk on uh, all of that portfolio either. either. Uh, you know that uh, uh, the uh, uh, long-term lease um, is uh, quite a small portion at this, at this stage. 
uh, in terms of the financing structure. So a big portion of the risk is actually uh, carried either by the consumer or by the retail network. Uh, so it's not a very material exposure. However, uh, we need to manage it, as Luca said. Um, and, uh, you know, we always take very, a very prudent approach to it. So we're, we're not making bets for the future. We monitor it on a quarterly basis. We adjust uh, the assumptions in terms of residual value based on what we do in the market. Uh, and we do, um, we say, test de rebouclage, uh, you know, sort of loop back tests um, every, uh, every closing with the team. And we look at the gain or losses that we, what, that we take in residual values and we're consistently very prudent. Uh, so at this stage, uh, no, no, no worries, but we'll keep monitoring it for the, for the future. Having, um, you know, owning a bank uh, with all the financial products and the different kind of financial, I think it's an advantage in this respect. So because we can, uh, you know, we can actually master the game, right, on one cycle, two cycles. Or so. so this is also one thing that you have to take into account in your, in your model for Renault. Thank you, Luca. Um, so now we have a thank question. You. Thank you, Daniel. Now we have a question of uh, Michael Jacks from Bank of America. Michael, please could you open your mic? Michael, the floor is yours. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Sure, thank you. I have two questions, if I may. Um, the first one is on pricing. Um, just want to want to find out to what extent are the price reductions that you made on the Megan E-Tech earlier this year covered by raw material tailwind? Because we appear that battery costs are declining quite materially um, versus competitiveness gains. And then moving on from that, um, you know, with with uh, these raw material cost reductions in mind and following price cuts by um, some of your peers specifically in the SUBC segment. Do you believe that um, the 40,000 euro entry price is now the correct level for the scenic or might you consider coming to market at a slightly lower level? Thank you. Uh, hi, so, so look on, uh, on the, uh, the reduction in price of Megan, uh, you know, our, our approach is we reduce the cost first and then we reduce the pricing second. Okay, so that's what we're doing. I won't go into the details of what represents raw material versus, uh, versus uh, sort of productivity. It's a combination of both. Um, I, I can tell you that uh, you know, our process as we launch every new EV vehicle is to look at the improvements that we make uh, from one generation to the next and explore the feasibility of changing, sort of retrofitting uh, the previous car uh, to take into consideration some of, the, some of the technical advances that we make on the new models. And that's what we're doing on Megan. So we are making good grounds in terms of, uh, in terms of cost reduction, but raw material is, is helping. But uh, I think the important message is we do cost reduction first, and then we do the pricing reduction after that uh, to try to protect the margin of the car. Uh, on the second part, uh, the price positioning of Scenic uh, the entry level is actually uh, slightly less than 40, not 45. Uh, so it's a very well positioned car. If you look at uh, the competition, including Chinese competition, uh, Scenic is going to be very well positioned. Thank you, Thierry. We now, have a, Thank you. We now have a question from uh, Pushkar Tendelkar, HSBC. Pushkar, please could you open your mic? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Philippine. Uh, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I have a couple of questions. So the first on the guidance or uh, just the assumption behind it in terms of pricing mix versus raw materials and FX. Do you think uh, you can keep that net effect at neutral in 2024? Uh, that's the first question. And the second one is particularly on the product mix. And I understand the impact of the Clio in the second half, but given the number of product launches that you're doing, and especially the C-segment mix, the negative print is a bit underwhelming. So do you see that reversing in 2024 now with the, again, the C and D-segment launches, or 
because you keep the price low it's this this mix is going to be weaker on the top line but let's say better on the profitability how do you see that developing Hi, Pushkar. Thanks. Thanks for the questions. Uh, so, so on the first question, uh, pricing mix versus raw material and effects. Uh, yes, the, the overall equation is going to continue to be positive. Uh, I think, uh, as we saw in the second half, uh, pricing is starting to ease. Um, you know, there's uh, less pressure from raw material to offset, etc. Uh, but uh, we will continue to do some pricing, um, and uh, one thing that we'll definitely continue to do is offset foreign exchange with pricing. Uh, you could see that uh, this was done very well by the teams this year, and uh, we'll, we'll continue to do so. Uh, so price will be a slight positive, but not to the same extent as what we had in 2023. Uh, mix will be positive, and I'll come back to that in, uh, in detail to answer your question. Uh, raw material turned a positive in the second half of this year, so it was roughly 320 million negative in the first half, and you know, uh, 100 million more. Um, positive in the second half, so it's going to continue to help us. Um, and then, um, you know, I would say the big change in terms of uh, the geography of how the profit is going to come together next year versus this year is that cost of goods sold is finally going to become a tailwind overall, uh, which it, it hasn't been for three or four years now. So that's, uh, that's the big change. Now, on your second question that's uh, around mix. So first on 23, um, you know, at the turnover level, um, uh, the mix effect was slower in the second half because of Clio. Uh, so <laughs> it, it's hard to be uh, disappointed with that. We just have a situation where Clio is selling very, very well. Um, and again, uh, the beauty of it is that we took a lot of cost out. So despite the fact that it's taking our average revenue per unit slightly down, it's actually improving uh, on, the margin, on the margin side. Uh, if you project yourself into 2024, things are going to change slightly because we are launching uh, a few cars that have um, you know, quite a high net revenue per unit, in particular Scenic, uh, the Renault 5, uh, Rafale. Uh, so we should see a uh, mix effect that will be positive at the turnover, turnover level. And we will continue to see the lift on the mix element at the margin level. Thank you, Thierry. We now have a question from Jose Sumendi, JP Morgan. Jose, please could you open your mic? Jose? Okay, if it doesn't work, um, we'll take a question from Philippe Bouchois, Jeffries. Philippe, please could you open your mic? Can you hear me? Ah, yeah. Can you, yeah, you can. Yeah, it just it takes a couple of seconds to unmute the phone here. Thank you so much, and congrats on the strong set of results. Uh, Luca, please, a couple of questions. Can you speak a little bit around the cost savings actions uh, that you're looking to execute in 2024? What are the biggest items you, you're looking to execute within the business uh, in the year to reduce the, the, the cost base? Uh, and second, can you comment on the uh, potential collaboration with Volkswagen on a small car? Uh, I understand there were some discussions at the end of the year, 2023, so we'd love to, to hear a little bit more, um, you know, any thoughts regarding this project. Uh, and second, Thierry, can you speak about uh, three categories? One, what are your assumptions on financial services, profits, uh, profitability in 2024? Are you looking for a slight decline of the earnings contribution? Uh, second, if I take the low end of your margin guidance uh, as a group, are you still expecting um, a margin improvement in the auto division? Uh, I understand you are looking for for margin improvement, but the consensus seems to be disagreeing with that view. Uh, and then three, can you talk about purchasing and manufacturing costs in the profit bridge for 2024? Thank you. Um, hola, Jose. Um, look, on the cost reduction, uh, I mean, I mean we, we could talk about that for an hour, but... Uh, one of the things is important to to understand is that, uh, on the, especially on the EV space, the creation of Ampere brings also another approach to the management of the, let's say, development of the product and the maintenance of the product. So basically, uh, in the in the traditional world, we would you know 
concentrate on developing a car, and then the same team would go for, for another model, come back to, into, in, into the you know, next generation for after five, six years. In the case of Ampere, because the technology is very evolutionary, people are on, focused on the two platforms that we have into Ampere the whole time. So if we find one day on Wednesday an opportunity to get 10 euros out of the thing, we try, we try to do it. Okay? And that's the kind of a spirit. So uh, we are working very hard uh, to make sure uh, that the cost of EV cars goes down with some decision that we would have never made before. Okay? I think that the, and it goes to the, you know, to answer to your second question, I'm not sure I can really talk about potential collaboration with other OEMs. The fact is that with what we're doing on the Twingo, on the A segment, we actually have a, you know, a setup, uh, uh, something that is from a manufacturing point of view, from a technology point of view, that is pretty unique. You don't have so many things like this in Europe. And because this segment historically was, you know, double digit in Europe and it went down like, you know, to a single, small single digit number, there is potential. It's, it could be a very relevant segment. And in the, in, the, in the world of EVs, when you can reduce the battery to, I don't know, less than 30 kilowatts into the thing, then you can get really competitive EVs that people can use. And, uh, and you can go into the volume. So uh, some people are interested in doing that. So my focus is to make sure that we can get the car out that is extremely competitive in terms of, uh, uh, let's say, technology cost. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I can't answer what, what, what's going on, but I can tell you that we're working very, very hard. And uh, even with, uh, with Gilles that is here, I think we took the opportunity of this product to completely revamp the product development, uh, you know, process at Renault to get the car done in around 20 years, uh, 20, sorry, two years, two years, which is, uh, I think, uh, it's pretty remarkable. And so this is now embedded and written on the stone uh, at Renault. And now we have to, pro you know, we have to prove that we can do it. But everybody's very motivated because, you know, speed, uh, speed is going to become more and more important in our industry especially if you want to face, uh, you know, the Chinese that are very quick. So it's going to save us money and uh, it's going to give us a chance to be always on the market when you need to be. Thanks. Uh, on, on your financial questions on, on financial services, um, you know, the contribution of uh, MFS is going to be a, a positive. So it's going to be an increase uh, next year, but primarily driven by the fact that we'll have the non-repeat of the negative uh, swaps valuation that we had in the 23 numbers. If you exclude that, it will be fly, uh, flat to a slight improvement. Um, the, the cost of risk is, uh, is very low. As you can see, the portfolio is very healthy. I think uh, it's important to understand that everything that we did to kind of increase the average selling price on the vehicles, uh, both through vehicle mix and through the pricing actions, is benefiting to MFS in the sense because the ticket size is improving. Uh, so we, we should be seeing continued uh, good performance from, uh, from that side of, uh, of the group. Uh, on the auto margin, so, you know, maybe it gives me an opportunity to come back to the impacts of horse. Um, so if, if you look at uh, total group margin, um, you know, we ended up at 7.9. In this, as I mentioned in the discussion, there's about 480 million that comes from uh, the fact that we stopped amortizing the assets of horse which is basically 100 basis points of non-cash uh, favorability, so that will not repeat. Um, when, we, uh, when we close uh, the, the deal uh, and we get regulatory approval, as I mentioned, we will start buying the parts from horse. Um, so we, inside the price, there will be the cost of amortization, which will resume, and there will be a slight margin. So before we close, we continue to get the lift from the fact that we're not amortizing, after we close, it starts being a, a slight negative. In the 2024 uh, construction, what we've assumed is that net-net, all of this is a slight negative, which means that if you look at the 7.5% guidance, it's really at least a 60, 60 uh, basis points improvement uh, year over year. And this comes mainly from the auto part uh, of the business. So, Operationally, absolutely, the auto margin is going to continue to improve uh, from a rate perspective. 
And then your, your last question was on uh, purchasing and cost reductions. Um, you, you know, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, the, the discussions on, you know, sort of compensation of uh, suppliers, et cetera, are, we're getting to the tail end of that. Uh, the impact that it had in the second half was a lot lower than in the first half. Um, and so the progress that we're making in discussions with suppliers is starting to pay off, which means that the big change in 2024 versus 23 is that uh, we're going to have a net gain in cost of goods sold. Uh, so that's good news going forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. We now have a question from Philippe Bouchois, Jeffries. Philippe, please, could you open your mic? Yeah, I think that's open. You should hear me now. A um, couple of questions for me. One is, um, I'm surprised I'm the first one asking about this Argentina um, effect. Um, this is not a recurring effect. So can you, why, why should we treat it as a recurring of, or would not take it out of, of, of the EBIT, in which case you would have missed your numbers? What am I missing there? And I have another question after that. Sure. Uh, so, so Argentina. Um, so this this subscription plan is the way it works. Is basically uh, people group. It's group of uh, actually mm -hmm. technically 168 people, and and they contribute to a pool uh, between 84 and 120 months. So seven years or 10 years. Okay. And every month mm -hmm. they pay uh, contribution to the pool, right? And they pay a subscription fees and and stuff like that. And once uh, the pool collectively has reached uh, the, the amount that finances a car, a car is allocated uh, to the pool, right? And so every month, each group gets two cars. One, we pick the client based on a draw, and the other, we pick the client based on a bidding war, okay? Um, and uh, then we ship the car to uh, the, the two people who are lucky enough to get it. Um, so, um, ba basically, uh, this year, we did price increases to offset the foreign exchange. Um, so, really, the way you should look at the impact of the Rombo plan, th this pool this year, is compensation for FX. So, if you look at our total mm -hmm. operating margin for Argentina, it was basically flat year over year. And this is nothing else than more pricing, but on a different type of sales, right? It's going to continue. Mm -hmm to be this way uh, in the coming year, although maybe to a lesser extent because, um, uh, because hopefully the inflation starts to abide. Uh, but uh, there's no you know, sort of one-off per se. It's a price increase to compensate foreign exchange. The price increases are, it's a given, right? So there's no mm -hmm. going back. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, you know, uh, out of uh, the 1.5 billion of operating margin increase, uh, none of it comes, off, comes from Argentina. It's an offset of effects, mm. which will continue yep. in the future. Okay, no, that makes sense. I, I appreciate that because it, uh, it looked like a convenient one-off otherwise. Yeah, um, and, by, and by the way, right. um, you, you know, all, yeah. all the, well, most of the auto manufacturers uh, do this in Argentina. It's a way to mm. uh, give access to mobility in an affordable fashion uh, mm. for the clients. And in a situation where uh, there is very high inflation, uh, people are actually buying cars so that they have an asset that they can rely on. Yeah. You, you know, it's like a, yeah. almost an investment. So it's it's a, mm. it, it's a, it's a successful plan. But all in all, for us, it was about offsetting effects, and we'll continue to do so in in the following years. Mm. Okay. And my other question was on. On the product, um, I think the big improvement we've seen over the last few years is definitely a revival of the Renault brand itself, the contribution of the models on those 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 cars. Um, the question I have is on on Dacia and on vans. Um, you you've it's it's a big business the van, but you are a smaller player compared to some of your competitors. And I'm just wondering, can you confirm that vans are accretive to group margins uh, still? And the other question I have is on Dacia. I think Dacia for many years had a lower cost base because it was kind of using kind of hand-me-down platforms from previous Renault cars. Today, the technology required to build a Dacia is more sophisticated. So your cost is going up, your pricing is going up as well. But can we be still comfortable that this, this kind of exceptional margin you've had on Dacia will continue? Um, because effectively the cost base of the Dacia cars, I think structurally is going up. Um, and then you'll ask you can confirm that you still have a very, very high share of retail buyers in the, in the Dacia brand. Thank you. Uh, Philippe, I'm surprised you're asking the question. 
such kind of question because EU know has uh, since many, many years. So you should know that LCV at Renault is actually accretive to the, you know, to the business. We do. Yeah, uh, I just want to hear it. You yeah, confirm it. Yeah. As, yeah. I can confirm you. Uh, the thing. <clears> and, right. Uh, okay. And you know what, what's happening? And normally, normally the master, so the, the heavy van is the cash cow uh, into the thing. So you normally have very long cycles. Uh, you know, and maybe 10, 12 year cycle. But when you come with a new car, you normally have a very, very big effect on profitability. Okay, so the product is very, very competitive. We have, uh, we have the Kangoo that is two, three years old is doing well. We have, uh, we have traffic that will probably renovate what is in the middle of the life cycle that works also very well. If you took, if you take only brand, Renault is number one in Europe on, 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 on commercial vehicle, of course, if uh, other people are using, uh, you know, the same car and they change badges, uh, you know, you sum up everything. But from a customer point of view, for, as a brand, we are very strong there. And on the Dacia, you know, of course we have a challenge. You have Denise here, maybe you will add something on it. But, um, you know, when you look at the position of the cars, we talked about earlier about Spring, uh, et cetera, but also Sandero number one. Uh, car in retail since you know many many years. Why is this? Because we have a clear advantage. In fact, what you have to understand is that on the B segment, we in Renault, unlike other OEMs, we have two level of cost structure on the same uh, platform. Okay, one way we call the CMFB Global Access, and the other one which is the I spec version of of, uh, of the thing. And that's what we use for Dacia. And what we decided two three years ago was to say, okay, for sure, regulation and the new technology will push up the cost of the thing. Dacia will always have to be relatively to its competition, you know, with the big, you know, cost advantage, which is still the case. And even it will be also still the case for next generation cars. But on top of that, we will give Dacia, we will break the crystal ceiling that uh, in the past mm -hmm. was kind of uh, given to the Dacia boys and girls that they could not enter the C-segment. Okay, so you look at the dust next generation, in terms of performance, it's almost a C-segment car. In terms of price, it's very competitive, but people will buy, you know, will not buy a car for 10,000 euro, but maybe for 25, 30,000 euro. And then uh, I can tell you, we make money. And when the big server come, it will be the same, it will be even better. And it's based on the B-segment platform. So I think that the Dacia receipt is still valid. The challenge that we ha we have is how do we handle the same uh, approach when the market will turn to uh, EV, okay? So if uh, if Dacia will have to sell majority of EVs, we need to find a solution. But we have a little bit of time. Of course, we are working on it. It's an issue probably for 28 uh, something for the renovation of the uh, Sandero, uh, you know, a family of, of cars. So we are we know it and we are working on it and I think technology will evolve in batteries and also cost. So we will be there at the right time. Okay, I don't know, Denis, if you want to add something. No, more I think you said it all. To, to answer say. precisely your question, we are 84% retail sales and we'll continue doing so. As Luca was saying, we do great results, as you could see on the B seg, mostly uh, brand number two and a solid double digit. Uh, operating profit and, and now for the next almost decade or at least seven years we're just starting the game on the CSEG which will be even more profitable for us so so the future is great still re reusing the same assets huh? this is all based on the same CMFB platform all, of, all, all that we do we started the Sandero two years ago and now we are growing on the CSEG and we we'll even leverage those assets in the international international operations of Renault. So this is uh, potentially up to a two million business that we are talking on the same platform. So a, we still continue milking the cow for, for long years ahead of us. Huh? Right. Thank you. Thank you, Denim. Uh, we now have a question from Enning Kosman, uh, Barclays. Enning, please could you open your mic? Enning, could you hear us? Okay, if it doesn't work, we will take the next question from Thomas Besson, Kepler Chevreux. Thomas, please could you open your mic? Sure, I think you can hear me. Yeah. Hello, Thomas. Okay, great. 
Hello, Philippine. Hello, everyone. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, I'd like to start first with, with your uh, balance sheet. I mean, you've been generating a very strong amount of cash. Uh, could, could you confirm uh, you should get, uh, in theory, a, a rating upgrade relatively quickly uh, from uh, SNP and, and remind us what's the impact uh, on your uh, expected cash returns, uh, notably talking about uh, uh, what is the plan for uh, disposing of more of the Nissan shares uh, over the coming months or, or, or years. Uh, second uh, question, totally un un unrelated. Uh, there's going to be a, a lot of uh, decisions uh, from uh, the people and, and politics that are going to impact your business in Europe sub substantially between the uh, uh, Parliament election in Europe in June, uh, the uh, European Co Commission uh, decision on, on taxes on, on Chinese cars, and, and other types of, of, of elections. While, while consumers seem to be increasingly reluctant to buy the car that uh, politics and, and regulation want them to buy. Uh, can you talk about the flexibility uh, Renault has going forward uh, if the penetration of BVs uh, naturally in Europe uh, gets uh, at a much lower pace than expected? Uh, and remind us, the proportion of BVs you have to sell in 25 to continue to sell the other cars. Uh, and last question. Uh, you talked about impairments, uh, so I'm back uh, for a question to, to, to Thierry, probably more. Can, can you talk about what you impaired uh, and, uh, and whether there's potentially a risk related to just my second question on potentially further impairments on, on BEVs? Uh, should uh, uh, you have to reinvest eventually more than you thought uh, uh, in uh, ICE territories? Thank you. You can start with the first one and go for the second. Uh, okay, uh, so, so, so look, uh, on, the, uh, on the rating, um, unfortunately it's not 100% under our control uh, because our friends at the rating agencies have their processes, as you know. Uh, we're in constant discussions with them. We gave them a, a preview of these results, which they, uh, they you know, Moody's and S&P both thought were very encouraging and actually slightly above what they expected. Um, so. You know, I, I think we're on the right track. Uh, we meet uh, technically the financial criteria uh, to be investment grade, uh, but then you know they also have sort of more subjective elements that they need to take into consideration. You know how our EV business is going to develop, etc. Uh, but we're hopeful uh, that we're going to get a re-rating relatively soon. Um, uh, in terms of effect on the financials, you know, our spread has improved quite a bit with the improvement of the financial performance uh, without, regardless of the rating change. However, we still have, you know, almost 100 basis points of difference versus the best in class in the automotive market. And so 100 basis points on, you know, roughly 15 billion a debt gives you, uh, gives you an idea of, you know, the incremental benefit <laughs> that we could get once, uh, once we achieve that. Um, on the last question, oh, sorry, on, on the Nissan shares, look, I mean, you, you know, the, the new structure that we've put in place where we've placed the, a portion of the shares in the trust, the intent is to rebalance to 15-15. So uh, clearly, you know, that's the intent. The calendar is not set. I mean, a bunch of conditions need to be fulfilled for us to continue to come down. You know, one of the of the elements is uh, the appetite of Nissan to do some more uh, uh, buybacks. Uh, uh, Steve and my counterpart at Nissan indicated during their earnings call that uh, they had capacity uh, to do a little bit. Um, um, so that'll be a positive, uh, but we have to look at uh, you know, several other conditions and importantly what we're going to do with the cash and how we redeploy it. So the intent is there, the calendar is, is obviously not set. And then on your question on the impairments, before I give the floor to Luca, uh, like every, every year we do a complete review of, uh, of, the, of the vehicle range and, and assess the business plan and the recoverability of the value of the assets. Uh, this year uh, we decided to do an impairment uh, uh, on, uh, on Megane. Uh, and I think we took into consideration the revised volume profile coming from the performance of the car and also coming from the market, and we thought it was good to adjust the value. Uh, and it represents a large portion of, uh, of the impairments figure that you saw. Uh, I think going forward, um, you know, we've reviewed the profile of all the other programs, and uh, so far it looks like, uh, you, you know, they're you know, significantly above the water, so, so no issue. We'll continue to look at it on a regular basis. What I can tell you is, um, 
you know, technology is advancing. And so, for example, in software, um, we used to capitalize, we don't capitalize anymore. Like, for example, software-defined vehicle, uh, we've decided not to capitalize uh, and to let those costs go through the PL directly uh, to be conservative. So you should see the capitalization ratio start to go down in 2024 and the years after that, because as you mentioned, the technology is a bit riskier and we want to be prudent. But uh, uh, other than that, no change in the process and we'll keep reviewing it on a regular basis. Thank you very much. Can I just have a, ask a quick follow-up on this vegan impairments? If that's okay, before uh, Luca answers the other question. Did, did you have to make any uh, one-off payments to some of the suppliers that uh, uh, obviously faced a uh, totally different volume there, than expected? There, yeah, there's a portion of, uh, of the cost that we took, uh, which is uh, a, a compensation of uh, volume shortfall. Uh, not necessarily a, okay. a very large portion, but, uh, but we included everything in, in that yeah, review. Thank you very much. Um, hi, Flip. Um, so, so um, um, I mean, from a from a process point of view, on, in Europe, I think nothing will be now decided before the new parliament is elected. So we'll see what happens uh, with the election. Um, what I want to say is that uh, you know, everybody now is like three years ago. You would tell us that if we would not do 100% electric cars, we would be a bunch of zombies. Uh, you know, uh, walking around, and now you're, you're, you're telling us that you know EV is not going to work. I don't think this, is, this is, it will be the case. I think EV will continue to be, you know, will, will grow in Europe and will become a dominant technology for a simple reason. We talk about you know Parliament regulation. We talk about uh, you know deadline in 2035, uh, revision close in 2026. But this is something that everybody forgets, and this is the fact that. Uh, we have cafe regulation and the cafe regulation you have to do in 2025 that means in eight months time from now you got to do below 100 grams of uh, of co2 in average for the fleet and the best combustion engine is like maybe 80 grams with hybrid and in 2030 you need to do 50. so you don't need you know you know, you don't need to be a Nobel Prize in mathematics to understand that uh, you need to sell a lot of electric cars. So we will, we will, you know, for sure push them, okay? And we will create the offer and uh, we will work also with other industry to make uh, sure that this thing works because it's also good for the environment, right? So I think that electric car will be dominant uh, technology in the long term. We'll have bumps, up and downs. It's not three months of change that will change the thing. But in the case of Renault, right from the beginning, we always said we're going to play on both sides because Renault actually has one of the best uh, hybrid in the world with the e-tech, okay? Very module technology, very competitive, etc. And that's why we, you know, we are pushing on that. That's why we did ORS because it's going to give us, uh, you know, we do an old school game of putting things together, finding productivity, synergies, etc., etc. We have potential to reinvent things, to develop, uh, you know, this technology, to develop the thing from a fuel, fuel point of view. And on the other side, we do Ampere to focus on a new sport, which is EV. And Ampere is, you know, designed not, you know, to be focus on that, but it's also not a, it's kind of a relatively asset light uh, organization. I think that Ampere, I think we gave this number, we probably be, uh, you know, on break even around the 300,000 units uh, with that system. The, we have a capacity, you know, theoretical capacity of 600,000 for the time being, if we push everything, but already at 300, we are, you know, we are making money. I don't remember what was the number of, uh, SGNA on Ampere is like 2.5 percent SGNA on Ampere. So we only have in Ampere what is right and what is important to do electric cars. So I think Renault is actually in a very very favorable position to master the you know the transition and to play you know on the piano where where we need to play. This is the reality of the thing. Very good hybrid technology and uh, very focused on EV with experience. So we'll see. But let's not give up 
the fact that uh, we need to push progress and technology in the automotive industry because that's important for Europe and uh, yeah, and for the people and for the environment. Great. Thank you, Luca. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, we now have a question from George Galliers, Goldman Sachs. George, please could you open your mic? Yeah, thank you for taking my questions. Um, I actually wanted to ask two questions which were more industry related, because I think if we look at Renault, you've delivered record results. You clearly have all the foundations in place for your EV strategy. But the market obviously isn't giving you full credit for that. And I think some of the market's concerns around the industry are why. So just with respect to end market developments and the state of end markets, we've seen you get your inventories very much in shape and flat year over year. But when you look around, do you think there is now excess inventory in your end markets and significant risk to pricing? Or would you describe the health of the end markets as still being a very good one um, and certainly significantly better than what we saw in the past? The second question I had, which really relates a little bit to what we were just discussing, is regarding the cafe standards. As mentioned, you have Ampere, you have exciting new products with the R5 and the Twingo. You clearly have done a huge amount to get your cost position very competitive, but the same can't necessarily be said for all your competitors. Do you get any sense that the industry would look to try and push back the cafe standards? And do you think there is any scope for that to happen post this year's elections? Maybe, uh, George, hi. I, I, I'm going to start with the, your second question. I, I actually think that I've never heard someone, uh, you know, questioning the CAFE standard. I mean, CAFE is not only for Europe. You have that kind of uh, system in many areas of the world. So a lot of discussion on, of course, regulation, Euro 7, you've, you've seen the things, and, you know, deadlines, whether it should be 35, 40, uh, uh, you know, revision clause, etc. But I have never heard anybody actually, uh, let's say, discussing about that. So because this thing is embedded in the system since, I don't know, how many years, right? Like probably 10 years it was, uh, yeah, and even more. So the fact is that, again, that we're going to have to be below 100 in 2025. Uh, that means basically it's very early, right? So our estimation is that you've got to be a, maybe a 25% mix of EVs to get there, right? Uh, we, we, the average of the market this year was 16, so we're not so far away from the thing. There will be a lot of offer coming. Um, and, uh, but to, to be uh, at 50, you have to sell majority of the cars in 2030 as a zero emission. So either it's in current regulations, either electric or hydrogen car. So I think that the, the OEMs and the industry will push for that. Of course, you have a lot of things that you have to fix, you know, and as, as we said, infrastructure. And of course, this market so far is very dependent on subsidies because the cost of the product is structurally higher than the classical IC. Uh, but it will come down, okay? Uh, so I have to say that, uh, you know, when I hear now that people, everybody is questioning the thing and putting a kind of a shadow on the potential performance of the industry because of that, I found it a little bit like dangerous, so, right? So the industry has put, as far as I know, in Europe, maybe something like 250 billion euro on electric uh, thing on the value chain. So now this, this investment has to return, and we will make it, uh, we'll make it work. In the case of Renault, uh, I think we have, uh, you know, we are, of course we have Ampere, but there's something that will help us is that we are the first one to, to have a B-segment next generation EV platform, okay, that will underpin products like Renault 5, Renault 4, Alpine, uh, uh, you know, the Micra uh, from Nissan, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, basically, mechanically, because this platform is, you know, maybe 30% cheaper than the, let's say, Megane Scenic platform, uh, you know, mechanically, we will bring down the access to EV 
uh, in terms of budget for the custom by, you know, 30, 35 percent. And this is where in a lot of market, uh, you know, where you find the customers. You don't find the customers at uh, 45,000, but, you know, below 30,000, you find them, right? A lot. Uh, so I think we have, um, we have a, a couple of years of advantage there. I think, by the way, also the, you know, the Chinese are very strong in C-segment, C-segment SUV and, you know, and the higher segment. That's not much, there's no much offer, even in China, for small cars, but European people, they buy small cars. Uh, look at, you know, look at the, you know, top five cars. You have cars like, you know, the 208, the Clio, the Sandero, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, this is where you sell car in Europe. And we have, and we are the first one to have such kind of thing. So I think we will go through 2025. I mean, based on our estimation right now, we will pass 2025, <coughs> and then we'll have to find a solution to get to 2030. Thank you, Luca. Uh, we now have a right. question from Pierre-Yves Kemener. Stifel, Pierre-Yves, please, could you open your mic? I think it's open. Um, hi. Good morning uh, to everyone. Thanks for taking a question, Pierre, with Stifel. Um, actually, I've got three questions. Um, could you confirm, um, uh, Thierry, that the starting point of the 2024 margin guide is restated for the horse impact? So, 7.5% plus outlook is built on 6.9% lending point in 2023. Uh, yeah, to, to make sure I understand your question, uh, that the 7.5 is built on the set, on the 6.9. Yes. So uh, again, uh, you, you know, we've assumed that the net impact of horse in 24 is actually a slight negative. Uh, again, because. Until we, de we deconsolidate, it's a positive through the fact that we stop the amortization. After the deconsolidation, it's a slight negative because we start paying the margin uh, to horse. The net net that we've incorporated in the 7.5 is a slight negative. So you should see the 7.5 comparable at least uh, to the 6.9. So at least a 60 basis points improvement. Right. Hopefully that okay, answers your thanks. question. Yeah, that, that was uh, the, the the direction of my question, um, and the the the, the, um, the headwind from horse in twenty four uh, should be captured in the uh, manufacturing cost bucket, I suspect, right? In uh, yeah, in the cost in the cost bucket, Ab absolutely. Yeah, yes. sure. Um, uh, second point is, uh, would it would it be fair for twenty twenty four to assume that? Volume should be a tailwind for, for Renault, likely low single digits on higher shipments, but not necessarily in the first quarter, which could still be uh, negative, or I am too uh, pessimistic for the full year or uh, for, for the first quarter. I think your assumptions uh, is correct. I mean, I think in Q1 of last year, we were still in the phase where, you know, components availability was coming back, etc. cetera. Uh, overall, for the year, you know, we... We always take a conservative approach on, on the volume assumptions. Uh, you know, we're, as Luca mentioned, we're launching 10 cars. The last thing we want is people to push them and not maximize the pricing. So we've, we will get uh, some kind of low single digit growth year over year, but it, sh it, it will be a tailwind, yes. Okay, thanks. Last on free cash flow. Um, uh, your guide for 24 um, should include roughly 1 billion of on pair cash bar or on pair funding, right? Well, we, something like that. I mean, we had said when we did the on pair CMD that it would be 1.5 billion over the uh, <clears throat> the period of uh, uh, 24 and first half of 25, and the cash burn is is included uh, obviously in the projection that we've given you. So. You know, again, uh, it's it's uh, it's good that you pointed out uh, because I've I've seen you know questions on whether we're able to fund on pair, etc. Uh, the cash that we've generated in 2023, uh, covering the cash burn of on pair, is more than two times the cash burn of on pair coming in the next two years. So there's there's absolutely zero question that we could keep funding on pair with the cash generation of the group, and that's what we're we're going to continue to do. 
I'm afraid, guys. On the work. Sorry, sorry, Pierre. I, I'm afraid we'll have to uh, stop because okay. we have to go to the media. So sorry for that. Uh, so I just want to, you know, thank you for being with us uh, this uh, hour and a half. And uh, so have a good day, and see you soon. I hope. Thank you very much, guys.